Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Director, uh, I appreciate your service in a previous life, um, and I, I got to confess to you, I was surprised when you used the phrase political bannering in your opening. Uh, I, I was not only surprised, I was disappointed, because uh, you seemed to direct that towards the Republicans. Um, it was the Solicitor General of this administration not two weeks ago before the Supreme Court who talked about the damage wreaked by the separation of families. Of course, he wasn't talking about Sarah Root's family, and he wasn't talking about Joshua Wilkerson's family, and he wasn't talking about Casey Chadwick's family or Kate Steinle's family. He was talking about the families of people who are not here legally. And that just struck me as a political comment that he made. And of course, it's not us on our side that advocate for sanctuary cities, which is quintessentially a political uh, analysis that we're going to allow state and local officials to uh, decline to follow federal process, but at the same time, we don't trust state and local cops enough to actually enforce immigration laws. That is a political calculus. That is not one done by folks on our side of the aisle. Uh, my friend from Maryland, uh, Mr. Cummings, uh, went to great lengths uh, to quote from uh, episodically from a single uh, Republican. Um, I've never heard him quote Secretary Castro, who has come before committees of this Congress and advocated for citizenship for all 12 million aspiring Americans. Like all 12 million can pass a background check. All 12 million, not a single one of them can't pass a background check. So if we're going to talk about political pandering and if we're going to use your phrase and you're the one who used it, um, I think we ought to at least acknowledge uh, there's, there's plenty of political pandering going on on, on your side as well. Uh, let, let, me, let me make myself a, a, a very clear, very clear. I was not referring to one party or the other. I asked for everyone to drop the political banter and, and fighting and help me get a, a system that works. All right, well I, I then, want the record to be clear on that. Let's you, the record's clear. Let's let the record be clear about one other thing, because I am vexed as to why Mr. Mejia was not detained. Can you tell me, as a former prosecutor, why the killer of Sarah Root was not detained? An individual from ICE looked at the specific facts and circumstances related to that matter. Uh, had this individual had uh, no criminal convictions, previous criminal convictions, and made a determination based on his judgment that uh, that he did not need to be detained. And surely, Can you and I disagree with that? No, 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 decision? no. It's more, it's more than that you and I disagree with that. Uh, that individual was, in fact, wrong because Mejia has failed to appear for court. Has he not? Has he absconded? It's very easy to look back, sir. Very well, easy to look back. And yes, uh, he has Well, absconded. I'm looking back so we can look forward and prevent the next one. Uh, exactly and that's about all like we can do. do unless we have a crystal ball is look back and see what facts we were given him. Mr. Mejia... The only two things you look at in a bond analysis are danger to the community and, and flight risk. Those are the only two things you look at. Uh, so help me understand why someone driving three times the legal rate of impairment who is not here legally, did he have any criminal history at all, any arrest at all? We did not find criminal history. I think I've been advised by Senator Ernst that he had some traffic violations previously. Uh, but criminal convictions, uh, I, our records in, didn't indicate that he had. Um, has he failed to appear subsequently for court appearances? Subsequent to what? Subsequent to his killing of Karis, Sarah Root. Oh, no, he did not appear for his uh, right. so he's, court hearing. Right, so he's failed to appear. That was my question. Absolutely. So the, the discretion exercised was wrong. <laughs> These are tough decisions, sir. This and one actually is not that tough to me, well, Director, with all due respect. It's not that tough. Okay. Federal judges... You, would you have granted a $5,000 bond for that, for that defendant? Uh, I, uh, I don't think the bond was set at $5,000. No, it was $50,000, which means he had to post $5,000. Yes. Would I, you have set that? Bond? I would not. If I were a judge of that state court, and I believe that was a judge of the state court system who made that decision, another factor that the officer uh, from ICE might have looked at uh, in making his decision. Uh, I will tell you, judges, 
make tough decisions every day, and we can point to uh, judges. I, I was on the receiving end of many of these as a prosecutor asking for bond, asking for detention, and a federal judge said no, and later that person absconded. Unfortunately, it irks me every time, of course. Unfortunately, it happens a lot. Well, it does happen, and sometimes there are tragic consequences. I'm out of time, so I will close up with this. Um, I believe in a previous life, I'm sure you work with state and local law enforcement in addition to federal law enforcement. Absolutely. And it's always struck me as unusual that we trust state and local law enforcement with the enforcement of every category of crime. I'm sure you had them on some task forces, whether it be narcotics, whether it be human trafficking. We trust them in child pornography cases. We trust them in all categories of cases, including traffic enforcement. So why don't we trust them in immigration cases? Well, we do, actually. We have a 287G program that we enlist the help of local law enforcement in, in helping us with uh, uh, immigration enforcement. There are a number of jurisdictions, and I've asked our people to expand that program. You've asked them to expand it because it seems like it's shrinking. No, sir. It's not shrinking other than maybe a jurisdiction withdrawing. That I can't control. We beg them to stay, but sometimes they withdraw based on uh, whatever consideration. So you do trust state and local law enforcement to enforce immigration laws, and you do not buy into the Democrat mantra that somehow racial profiling prevents them from being able to enforce that category of crime, but not any other category of crime? Well, that's a fully loaded question, which I'd like to break down, because I, I, there, there is racial profiling, sir. I'm not saying that it happens every day, but there is. And so for me to agree with your general proposition uh, would require me to agree with parts of it that I don't agree with. Well, I'd like to have this conversation more because there would be racial profiling in narcotics cases. There's racial profiling in traffic stop cases, and that doesn't stop feds and state and locals from partnering. So I, I'm just trying to understand why immigration cases are different. And I, I think I said they're not different. We have a you may have said it, but, but, but my Democrat colleagues have not. You may have. Gentlemen's time's expired. The chair now recognizes Delegate Norton for five minutes. And I want to thank you for not only the panel that's before us, but the panel you, you tried to have before us. Uh, not only did Ben Rhodes not appearing cost us an opportunity to, to question Mr. Rhodes, it cost us uh, the opportunity and the privilege to ask questions of our uh, friend and colleague, Tommy Cotton. Speaking of constitutional crisis, hauling a United States senator before a committee of Congress would really have created a constitutional crisis. So good thing for us, Tommy was willing to come on his own. And it would have, the background contrast would have been interesting to me. You know, the White House is very critical of Senator Cotton uh, and has been for several months now. Uh, Senator Cotton, um, of course, when he was serving tours of duty in the United States Army in Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, Ben Rhodes was navigating the, the mean streets of a creative writing curriculum in, in, in his post, literally, I mean that literally, that, that is not figurative, he, he has a master's in creative writing. Um, and if you're interested in writing haikus and sonnets and novellas, he's probably the right guy. On the other hand, if you're advising the leader of the free world on foreign policy matters, I, I, don't, I don't know how a haiku helps. But I would have enjoyed the opportunity to ask Mr. Rhodes how his background prepared him to sell the Iranian deal, but yet Tommy Cotton's background did not prepare him to criticize the Iranian deal. That, that would have been an interesting dichotomy for me. But what I really wanted to do, Mr. Chairman, w was ask Mr. Rhodes to help me, as Gruber did in the past, understand what he meant by certain things. Mr. Chairman, he said, we created an echo chamber. Does the chairman know who we is? I do not. Well, certainly he couldn't be referring to other presidential advisors because he then invoked executive privilege and he can't be talking about what other presidential advisors said. So it couldn't be that, could it? I, I don't, do not know. Okay. Well, then he said, reporters call us to explain to them what's happening in Moscow and Cairo. And I'm curious which reporters that would be. Which ones call him to find out what's going on in Cairo? But, but we can't ask him because he's, he's not here. And I would add, he has plenty of time to sit down for what he had hoped to be a fluff piece in the New York Times. He's been on television plenty of times. He had plenty of time to draft memos for the president, but he doesn't have time to come before 
a committee of Congress. And then this is what really concerns me, Mr. Chairman, in talking about those reporters, he said they literally know nothing. How does someone literally know nothing? He said they were 27 years old, which suggests that they probably have a driver's license at that point. You have to know something to get a driver's license. If they're 27, they'd be eligible to vote, to, to vote in the Democrat primary, more than likely. So you have to know something. So I don't, when you say they literally know nothing, that struck me. I wanted to ask him about that. Also, I think that his appearance today, had he bothered to come, would have created an opportunity for a little bit of bipartisanship, which I know our friends on the other side of the aisle uh, like from time to time. It said he expressed contempt for the editors and reporters at the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the New Yorker. That might have provided an opportunity for some bipartisanship. It would have given us an opportunity to share our own frustrations. But he didn't come. Mr. Chairman, um, you do a great job leading this committee. It's up to you whether or not you assert the people's right to question Ben Rhodes. But this selective use of uh, executive privilege on one day, but it's not executive privilege to, on the next, at some point Congress is going to have to stick up for itself. We're going to have to decide whether or not we do have a right to question people. And if you have time to make these comments to a reporter, you ought to be able to come explain yourself. And if you have time at the White House to send a bunch of mean tweets about a guy who served two tours, two compact tours in Tommy Cotton, and he's willing to come, but the creative writing expert isn't willing to come. At some point, this body is going to have to stick up for itself. With that, I'd yield back to the chairman. Thank the gentleman. Well, All right. Since I have been here, there has been one request for an increase in the debt ceiling. I understand there's another one coming. I don't know whether it will come before the first Tuesday in November or after the first Tuesday in November. I want you to assume, and again, I'm not going to hold you to the number. You don't need to go research it. Uh, you're smart enough. I've seen you testify before enough to know that you probably will be able to answer this question off the top of your head. If this were the last debt ceiling increase you could ask for, the final one, and you had to make it large enough for all current and future obligations, what would the request need to be? Well, I don't, I don't know how to answer that question. Let me answer it slightly differently. It, may, it makes no sense for the country, since Congress controls how much we can borrow every year. We have no independent authority to spend beyond what Congress authorizes. For Congress to put itself and its members through the position every six months or every year to hold a separate vote, politically difficult vote, on whether they should continue to authorize us to do things they have already authorized us to do. But I don't know how to answer that question, because you are talking about um, the future. The best way to well, the last debt ceiling increase was for how long and for how much? Well, uh, well the, under the deal we reached last August, uh, we set up a mechanism, I believe, where Congress uh, imposed on itself three votes over a 15-month period. Uh, what will be the amount of the increase uh, in November or December? Well, it depends. You know, this is Congress makes this choice, and the Congress has to make the choice based on how much time they want to give them. So right, but you've seen the numbers. In fact, you, I, I made a note. You used the exact same word that Chairman Ryan uses, and I hope they don't run any ad showing you pushing a senior citizen off a cliff in a wheelchair for using that word. But you just used the word unsustainable. Right. So my question to you is: If we had one more chance to borrow all the money that we need assuming current variables, how big would that number have to be? I don't know how to answer that. I think that if you, uh, let me try this a little differently. You you have to decide as a member of Congress how much time you want to give Congress before you have to vote on it again. And you can choose that amount of time. The larger the number you create, the do it. But again, the debt limit uh, doesn't decide how much we can borrow. You decide how much we can borrow, because every year you decide how, how what much can debt would we need to meet current and future obligations, assuming the status quo indefinitely. Well, that I would be happy to get you in writing. I can't do it in my head, though. How about a round number? No, no idea. I just can't do it in writing. But if, if your question is, is that if Congress authorized no additional increase in spending or revenues right. forever, how much we have to borrow? Uh, I, I can do that question in math, but I got to. Twenty trillion. I, I just can't do it in my head. Fifty trillion. 
<laughs> I don't know. I've seen you work before. You're smart. You're quick. <laughs> Not smart enough. A lot? Question. Can we agree it'd be a lot? It would be a lot. Uh, it would make you uncomfortable. Right. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I couldn't help but think when Secretary Geithner from the Treasury came that we had a glimpse of Wall Street, so I don't know whether the gentleman is counting that as a Goldman Sachs visit or not. Ms. Waits, you um, went through, and I tried to take notes, you went through an incident that happened with respect to the Children's Fund and uh, what strikes me as being tantamount to an involuntary contribution. Could you go back, just take 30 seconds and go back through that factual predicate for us one more time? What happened? Well, in 2004, when I went to the Delegate Assembly, we were told right off that it was non-negotiable. We had to make a donation to the Children's Fund in two separate payments that amounted $180, which I finally did, and I procrastinated because I had I couldn't figure out why it had to be two different payments, and I couldn't figure out why it wasn't tax deductible. But the name is the Children's Fund. It's um, the Fund for Children in Public Education. So you assume it's for children in public education. Oh, it, who in the world could possibly be opposed to something <laughs> called a children's? Yeah, fund? if you ask a teacher to give money. A teacher may have $2 in her purse, and if you ask for that $2, that teacher is going to give a child the money. That is just what we do. Are you familiar with the work of the Children's Fund? I was not until the last day of the assembly when they announced that it, the money that had been raised through the Children's Fund would go to the campaign. In 2004, it was John Kerry. In 2008, it was Obama. And that was the very last day. Now, I found out what the nature of the Children's Fund was in the women's bathroom on a break when two ladies from California told me. I asked them if they were required to give because everyone, you were, you were very pressured into donating. And they said, no, it was a political fund. And that's how I originally found out about it was from some other lady. We, we may have a clip, Mr. Chairman, um, of an ad run by the Children's Fund. Let's see if we have one here. What do we know about Tom Ganley? We know used car salesman Tom Ganley was sanctioned for deceptive advertising. Now he says he wants to bring jobs back from overseas. The same Tom Ganley who signed a pledge to protect tax breaks for companies who ship jobs overseas. Can't trust Tom Ganley on cars. Can't trust him on jobs. We just can't trust Tom Ganley. NEA Fund for Children and Public Education is responsible for the content of this advertising. Wow. I didn't see a word about children or education. Yeah, if, if you're going to have a political fund, name it a political fund, especially when you're in an education field. Uh, people will give to children for any type of education purpose. I speculated, um, NEA gives teacher grants, and I originally thought, okay, maybe it will go to teacher grants, and then I thought, well, maybe it will go to underprivileged children or children in high poverty areas. And Children's Fund is a children's fund. It shouldn't be a political fund. And so that's you what didn't they know it was going to go for an attack ad in a, no, in sir. a partisan no, race? Sir. Now, it, it, something in your original uh, opening statement led me to believe that, that there was uh, not only a component of involuntariness to it, but that there was perhaps some shenanigans with travel money. I, it, uh, they, they took dues from BCEA members, and they included the amount of the donation in 2008 into our travel money. Because when I kept insisting to have the money back, I was told to stop insisting because the amount was included in my travel money that was separate from my travel money, so which infuriated me even more. They used our BCEA dues to um, contribute. Professor Dow Schmidt, I, Dow Schmidt. Uh, Dow Schmidt, excuse me. I was just a country prosecutor. I never got into FEC law. And is that legal? I, what she just described? I am a labor and employment law professor. So oh, I but you have an idea, opinion. don't you? Well, I would, I would give you my opinion that uh, um, uh, I find that disturbing, too, frankly. Uh, she's a I, I didn't ask lady. whether you found it disturbing. Well, I asked whether you found it legal or not. Uh, that I don't have an opinion on. I, I don't know. I don't know that law. As I understand, she did file a complaint that was, that was denied. 
she is a State employee, so she is governed by State law, so I can't tell you what the State law is on her, on her objecting. But uh, I, I think she has got a legitimate complaint there that, that if they, uh, if they uh, put forward that fund in that way, that she should expect it to go for, uh, uh, it, it should be clear whether it is for politics or not. I suppose they could make the argument that this guy was against children somehow, and so therefore this was the best way to use that money. But, but I think, I think, I think she has got a legitimate complaint, and, and I would be interested to see you know, why her complaint was, was dismissed. I'm afraid I'm out of time, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, the gentleman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Director, uh, I appreciate your service in a previous life, um, and I, I got to confess to you, I was surprised when you used the phrase "political bannering" in your opening. Uh, I, I was not only surprised, I was disappointed because uh, you seemed to direct that towards the Republicans. Um, it was the Solicitor General of this administration, not two weeks ago, before the Supreme Court, who talked about the damage wreaked by the separation of families. Of course, he wasn't talking about Sarah Root's family, and he wasn't talking about Joshua Wilkerson's family, and he wasn't talking about Casey Chadwick's family or Kate Steinle's family. He was talking about the families of people who are not here legally. And that just struck me as a political comment that he made. And of course, it's not us on our side that advocate for sanctuary cities, which is quintessentially a political uh, analysis that we're going to allow state and local officials to uh, decline to follow federal process, but at the same time, we don't trust state and local cops enough to actually enforce immigration laws. That is a political calculus. That is not one done by folks on our side of the aisle. Uh, my friend from Maryland, uh, Mr. Cummings, uh, went to great lengths uh, to quote from uh, episodically from a single uh, Republican. Um, I've never heard him quote Secretary Castro, who has come before committees of this Congress and advocated for citizenship for all 12 million aspiring Americans. Like all 12 million can pass a background check. All 12 million, not a single one of them can't pass a background check. So if we're going to talk about political pandering and if we're going to use your phrase and you're the one who used it, um, I think we ought to at least acknowledge uh, there's, there's plenty of political pandering going on on, on your side as well. Uh, let, let, me, let me make myself a, a, a very clear, very clear. I was not referring to one party or the other. I asked for everyone to drop the political banter and, and fighting and help me get a, a system that works. All right, I, well I then, want the record to be clear on that. Let's you, the record's clear. Let's let the record be clear about one other thing, because I am vexed as to why Mr. Mejia was not detained. Can you tell me, as a former prosecutor, why the killer of Sarah Root was not detained? An individual from ICE looked at the specific facts and circumstances related to that matter. Uh, had this individual had uh, no criminal convictions, previous criminal convictions, and made a determination based on his judgment that uh, that he did not need to be detained. And Can surely, you and I disagree with that? No, 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 decision? no. It's more, it's more than that you and I disagree with that. Uh, that individual was, in fact, wrong because Mejia has failed to appear for court, has he not? Has he absconded? It's very easy to look back, sir. Very well, easy to look back. And yes, uh, he has. Well, absconded. I'm looking back so we can look forward and prevent the next one. Uh, exactly and that's about all like we can do. do unless we have a crystal ball is look back and see what facts we were given him asking for bond, asking for detention, and a federal judge said no, and later that person absconded. Unfortunately, it irks me every time, of course. Unfortunately, it happens a lot. Well, it does happen, and sometimes there are tragic consequences. I'm out of time, so I will close up with this. Um, I believe in a previous life, I'm sure you work with state and local law enforcement in addition to federal law enforcement. Absolutely. And it's always struck me as unusual that we trust state and local law enforcement with the enforcement of every category of crime. I'm sure you had them on some task forces, whether it be narcotics, whether it be human trafficking. We trust them in child pornography cases. We trust them in all categories of cases, including traffic enforcement. So why don't we trust them in immigration cases? Well, we do, actually. We have a 287G program that we enlist the help of local law enforcement in, in helping us with uh, uh, immigration enforcement. There are a number of jurisdictions, and I've asked our people to expand that program. You've asked them to expand it, because it seems like it's shrinking. 
No, sir. It's not shrinking, other than maybe a jurisdiction withdrawing. That I can't control. We beg them to stay, but sometimes they withdraw based on uh, whatever consideration. So you do trust state and local law enforcement to enforce immigration laws, and you do not buy into the Democrat mantra that somehow racial profiling prevents them from being able to enforce that category of crime, but not any other category of crime? Well, that's a fully loaded question, which I'd like to break down, because I, I, it, there, there is racial profiling, sir. I'm not saying that it happens every day, but there is. And so for me to agree with your general proposition... Uh, Mr. Mejia, the only two things you look at in a bond analysis are danger to the community and, and flight risk. Those are the only two things you look at. Uh, so help me understand why someone driving three times the legal rate of impairment who is not here legally, did he have any criminal history at all, any arrest at all? We did not find criminal history. I think I've been advised by Senator Ernst that he had some traffic violations previously. Uh, but criminal convictions, uh, I, our records in, didn't indicate that he had. Um, has he failed to appear subsequently for court appearances? Subsequent to what? Subsequent to his killing of Karis, Sarah Root. Oh, no, he did not appear for his uh, right. So he's, court hearing. Right, so he's failed to appear. That was my question. Absolutely. So the, the discretion exercised was wrong. <laughs> These are tough decisions, sir. This and one actually is not that tough to me, well, Director, with all due respect. It's not that tough. Okay. Federal judges... You, would you have granted a $5,000 bond for that, for that defendant? Uh, I... Uh, I don't think the bond was set at 5000 It was 50000 which means he had to post 5000 Yes. Would I, you have set that? Bond? I would not. If I were a judge of that state court, and I believe that was a judge of the state court system who made that decision. Another factor that the officer uh, from ICE might have looked at uh, in making his decision. Uh, I will tell you, judges uh, make tough decisions every day, and we can point to uh, judges I was on the receiving end of many of these as a prosecutor and require me to agree with parts of it that I don't agree with. Well, I'd like to have this conversation more because there would be racial profiling in narcotics cases. There's racial profiling in traffic stop cases, and that doesn't stop feds and state and locals from partnering. So I, I'm just trying to understand why immigration cases are different. And I, I think I said they're not different. We have a you may have said it, but, but, but my Democrat colleagues have not. You may have. Gentlemen's time's expired. The chair now recognizes Delegate Norton for five minutes. I want to thank you for not only the panel that's before us, but the panel you, you tried to have before us. Uh, not only did Ben Rhodes not appearing cost us an opportunity to, to question Mr. Rhodes, it cost us uh, the opportunity and the privilege to ask questions of our uh, friend and colleague, Tommy Cotton. Speaking of constitutional crisis, hauling a United States Senator before a committee of Congress would really have created a constitutional crisis. So good thing for us, Tommy was willing to come on his own. And it would have, the background contrast would have been interesting to me. You know, the White House is very critical of Senator Cotton uh, and has been for several months now. Uh, Senator Cotton, um, of course, when he was serving tours of duty in the United States Army in Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, Ben Rhodes was navigating the, the mean streets of a creative writing curriculum in, in, in his post, literally, I mean that literally, that, that is not figurative, he has a master's in creative writing. Um, and if you're interested in writing haikus and sonnets and novels,